stack banana till the morning come. Daylight come and me one go home. Come, Mr. Tallyman, tally me banana. Daylight come. Me banana, they like come. I can't take this anymore. All we want to do is hear that sound. All we want to do is hear that sound. <laughs> <laughs> Get rambling. Beetlejuice is a 1988 horror comedy starring Alec Baldwin, Gina Davis, Catherine O'Hara, Winona Ryder, and Michael Keaton. It tells the story of two families, the Maitlands, a recently deceased couple attempting to haunt their old house, and the Dietzes, the house's new inhabitants. As they vie for control of the property, both families enlist the help of Beetlejuice, a demon who exercises the living from their homes. Hijinks ensue. Beetlejuice the movie was directed by Tim Burton. Though he wasn't yet a household name, Burton had recently found success directing Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and as a result, he had the freedom to choose whatever project he wanted. After being pitched several ideas that he considered to be unimaginative and uninspired, Burton was eventually given an early version of Beetlejuice. After some pretty drastic alterations, the project was underway. The people working on this movie would have grown up in the 1960s, presumably watching shows like Casper, The Munsters, and The Addams Family. The guy asked for something spooky. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. He said, gospel's not selling. Give me something spooky. I don't know what it was, but something about that time period made Americans decide that they only wanted light-hearted, macabre twists on the nuclear family. Tim Burton and the Brothers Warner would see this trend and bring Beetlejuice into the fold. Only about 20 years too late. Kind of like me getting into the YouTube game. The film was received mostly positively by both critics and audiences, while it received no opinions from me as I went until 2020 without ever watching it. I was familiar with the iconography, I knew the basic premise, but I had never actually seen it. I was content to continue living my life this way, but in 2018, something special happened. After numerous forays into other forms of media, the Beetlejuice IP was finally turned into something that grabbed my attention. A Broadway musical. The whole Even though I knew little about the source material, I fell in love with the musical immediately, watching various bootlegs, also known as slime tutorials, and listening through the soundtrack on a near daily basis. It was like the first time I heard the Beatles. Welcome to a show about death. And I'm gonna need some help. Harvey, I know these briefs backwards. Perfect in every way. Eventually, in October of 2020, I decided I should finally get around to watching the movie. After all, the musical had quickly become one of my favorites. Maybe the movie could do the same, right? Right? No, 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 no. No, no, it's a horrendous piece of shit. I figured going in that I would prefer the musical format, but I was truly not prepared for how underwhelmed this movie would leave me feeling. I am very disappointed! And this went beyond the criticisms I expected to have, like Why is no one singing? Why is no one dancing? What's wrong with Hollywood? No, I was far beyond those nitpicks. So far beyond, in fact, that I had to write this ridiculous essay, explaining why Beetlejuice is garbage, and if you like it, you should feel bad. Really? No, not really. I can't back that up. Okay, not really. Beetlejuice 1988 may not be downright bad, but it's nowhere near as good as I expected it to be either. Even from an outsider's perspective, this movie seemed to be iconic, yet I just don't get it. In, in my, my opinion, opinion, the creators of Beetlejuice the Musical used hindsight to their advantage, improving the movie in nearly every way, and I'm going to tell you why. In order to best convey my mindset while watching this movie, I'm going to be discussing the 2018 musical first, then the 1988 film. Then the large women. Then the petite women. Then the large women again. So that's the order I experienced them, not the order they were released. I know some of you may be thinking, you could do that? Yes, nerd. It's backwards! What do I do? I don't know! I don't know. But I truly believe this is the best way to get my point across. I want you all to know what it felt like to fall in love with one version of the story, only to view the source material and find it devoid of almost everything that makes the modern adaptation great. Why is God punishing me? Why, Shug? If this approach really bothers you for some reason, keep in mind that I have no idea what I'm doing. 
I don't know what any of this shit is, and I'm fucking scared. And I don't come down to Burger King and tell you how to do your job. Hey, I don't work at Burger King. I don't work at Burger King. I'm busy. I know that's not how most people would do it, but I also know that I'm not the only person to see one of the later versions of this character before seeing his original incarnation. If you're one of those people, Shay Frillis, I'm looking at you, I want you to know that you're not in this alone. We're aware that better versions of the story exist. You're not the only one cursed with knowledge. It's in my hand, I will go insane and I will take you with me! At this point, I have so many unprompted opinions on Beetlejuice that I don't know what else to do with them. I'm forcing them onto anybody that will hear them. This beetle hole goes so deep that I've been doing nothing but eating, breathing, and shitting Beetlejuice for months now. My mouth is purple, and when I look in the toilet bowl, it's purple. Purple and black! I know you know about the Beetlejuice video games, and the animated series, and the on-again, off-again sequel that was going to be set in Hawaii, and that split second that he might have appeared at Space Jam, and the e Beetlejuice wrestling. No! The shitty Beatles, are they any good? They suck. But it's not just a clever name. I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm here to compare Beetlejuice the musical with Beetlejuice the movie. Just those two things. Just those two things. Just those two things. Why must we pit these adaptations against each other? Why can't you let people enjoy things? Poor K. Melo's dose. Because that's not how I do things, that's why I made a choice, and damn it, you can too. You never know when some lunatic will come along with a sadistic choice. Trust me, when you see things from my perspective, it's not a difficult choice to make. So if you believe Beetlejuice's story is best told in the movie, or if you've never experienced the musical for whatever reason, stick around as I, I implore you to reconsider. A content warning before we move forward. Due to the nature of these stories, this essay will be filled with foul language, sexual references, discussions of queerness, anxiety, depression, racism, unresolved daddy issues, violence, death, and suicidal ideation. Then at some point I'll probably talk about Beetlejuice. <laughs> With that out of the way, forget everything you think you know about Beetlejuice. Michael Keaton is Beetlejuice. Is he though? I said everything and settle in because I put a lot of thought into this and I've got lots of shit to say. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. It's showtime. It's showtime! It's showtime! That's my thing that I say! Hi! I'll be your guide! I'll be your G-U-I-D-E to the other side! Part 1. Beetlejuice the Musical, the Musical, the Musical. Beetlejuice the Musical was written by Eddie Perfect, Scott Brown, and Anthony King. In terms of style, the musical features a lot of synth pop and power ballads encased in what I've seen described as Tumblr humor. This may sound off-putting to some, but I think this works great for this adaptation. I mean, come on, we're talking about a suicidal teenager forced to relocate with her father who eventually gets together with a dead guy who's thousands of years old. What kind of audience did you expect to latch onto a story like this? The musical opens on the funeral for Emily Dietz, wife to Charles and mother to Lydia, the musical's protagonist. Emily Dietz is a character that doesn't exist in the movie but plays an essential role in the musical. Lydia will spend the story mourning her mother, doing anything she can to get her father to acknowledge the tragedy that just struck their family. Lydia explains her feelings in the opening ballad, Invisible. Like the title suggests, Lydia sings about how when you're in mourning, particularly as a child, nobody else seems to see you or truly understand what you're going through. The idea of feeling invisible to the world around you is a running theme throughout the show, and both Lydia and Beetlejuice will have to find ways to overcome this obstacle. Holy crap! A ballad already! Alright, enough with the goo-goo eyes. We've got work to do. Let's go. Beetlejuice reveals himself to the audience as a casual observer of the funeral, immediately commenting that this opening is a bold departure from the original source material. While that may be true, as somebody who experienced the musical first, this seems like the only logical way to open the story. Okay, folks, Beetlejuice moves right into his first song in the true opener of the show, The Whole Being Dead Thing. Beetlejuice spends this song addressing the audience directly, as he mocks the mourners of the funeral as well as the entire concept of living life to its fullest. Beetlejuice believes that any appreciation of life is pointless, and everybody should face the truth that death is an inevitability and that being dead has its perks. Also, Beetlejuice takes many opportunities to let the audience know that this is a show about death. I hope 
hope you're ready for a show about death! You're probably gonna die. After the song, Beetlejuice explains that he is a dead guy stuck in the world of the living, and that in order to be freed from this state, a living person needs to say his name three times. Also, Beetlejuice can't directly affect the world around him, but recently deceased people can. I'm invisible, powerless, like a gay Republican. So Beetlejuice plans to manipulate a soon-to-be-dead couple that he's been watching for some time. I've been watching them for a while, and yes, it's been very creepy. And now, finally, they're about to die. Enter our other protagonists, Adam and Barbara Maitland. The Maitlands are a loving young couple that Beetlejuice will eventually go on to describe as super polite, middle class, suburban, and white. Deep down, the Maitlands really want to start a family, but constantly make excuses not to. Their rationalizations include wanting to fix up their house, wanting to learn more skills, or figuring that they have all the time in the world to have a child. This is all covered in the couple's opening duet, Ready, Set, Not Yet. We're shown that Adam currently focuses his energy on carpentry, as he lovingly builds a crib for a different couple, in case you needed some on-the-nose visuals to go with the metaphor. Meanwhile, Barbara spends her time doing pottery. Look at these jobs. Neither Maitland lacks self-awareness, as they both acknowledge that their hobbies act as reminders that they're not mentally prepared to start a family. Listen, that's called motherfucking bars, nigga. Fucking you know nothing about that. Bars, nigga. The song is absolutely one of my favorites in the show, and in my opinion, endears you to the couple instantly. Hopefully you didn't get too attached, because the couple's song ends with them dying and they fall through some faulty floorboards. Beetlejuice did warn us that they were about to die. Having witnessed these events unfold, Beetlejuice starts putting his plan together. Upon death, newly deads have a number of rules they're supposed to follow, which are covered in the Handbook for the Recently Deceased. This book is supposed to be issued to every newly dead person, but Beetlejuice intercepts it as it appears at the Maitland's house. Beetlejuice derisively puppeteers the book, revealing that the first thing you're supposed to do when you die is proceed directly to the netherworld. Beetlejuice can't allow the Maitlands to know this, since he wants them to stay and haunt their house, so he throws the book into the fireplace and he hides. Puppet show! Mr. The Maitlands emerge from the basement and quickly come to grips with what just happened. Upon realizing that they didn't survive the fall, Bra Bra laments that there was so much left in life that she still wanted to do. What's her name, Bra Bra? No, I think it was Barbara. Her name was Bra Bra. It was Barbara. There's no such name as Bra Bra. It's Bra Bra. It's Barbara. It was Bra Bra. Barbara. Bra Bra. Bra Bra. Bra Bra. Bra Bra. Well, Adam believes that since they've still got their house and their possessions, nothing needs to change. Beetlejuice reveals himself to the Maitlands, confirming that they're dead, he's dead, and proposes that maybe they can help each other. The Maitlands begin to panic, so Beetlejuice calms them down with the power of show tunes. In the whole Being Dead thing part 2, Beetlejuice offers to guide the Maitlands through the afterlife. He also tells them that they're special since they died together and in their own home, and this gives them a chance to haunt their house. The two of you are special! You died together! That never happens! Unless, of course, it's a murder-suicide, which makes for a very awkward eternity. Beetlejuice goes on to say that even though they're not scary now, he can teach them the way. The Maitlands are dismayed as movers enter the house and begin taking their possessions to the dump. They can't see us! A keen observation of <laughs> Ignore the dead. We are invisible. And breathers worry so much about their stupid little lives, most of them never notice anything strange or unusual unless you make them. And that's why they're doing it. Not wanting to lose their material belongings, they agree to let Beetlejuice help them, and the three of them retreat to the attic. The house's new inhabitants are none other than the Dietz family, who we are introduced to in the prologue. Enter Charles Dietz, real estate mogul and Lydia's father, and Delia Schlimmer, a life coach hired for Lydia with whom Charles is having a secret affair. Don't you matter, Charles. If we make it look fabulous, no one will ever know it's actually crushingly insecure and older than it says it is. 
Charles bought this house with the intention of turning it into a flagship model home for his new gated community. In two days, the couple plans to host a dinner for Maxie Dean, a potentially huge investor that Charles needs to impress. Is my wife waiting? I don't see a race. Lastly, we're officially introduced to Lydia as she pretends to be dead on a couch carried in by two movers. <laughs> Lydia Dietz is a playfully morbid teenager who is still mourning the loss of her mother. She didn't want her family to uproot because Dead mom looked our house. Dead mom? Lydia tries to connect with her father, holding his hands and reminiscing about when they moved into their last house. When they got there, it was falling apart, but Emily remained optimistic, leading the trio as the three of them saying jump in line. Charles seems to get caught up in the memory for a brief moment, but promptly brushes Lydia off, insisting that they need to move forward as a family. Charles has never been willing to discuss Emily's death with Lydia, and is seen passing her off to Delia whenever she brings up the topic. I never want to talk about it. That's because I'm trying. Delia, do your job, please. Life culture. Lydia will try anything to get Charles to simply acknowledge their family's loss, even regularly referring to Emily as dead mom in an attempt to goad Charles into talking about her. Nothing Lydia does works, and her father ignores her while Delia insists that she have a more positive outlook on life. Lydia is left alone to sing, literally unpacking boxes as she metaphorically unpacks her emotions. Lydia and Emily were clearly very close. Lydia sings about how nothing is funny anymore, she feels out of place and invisible wherever she goes, and her father won't even talk to her about any of it. Lydia can still feel her mother all around her and begs her to send a sign that she's being seen. One small detail I love is how at one point in the song, Lydia describes herself as your clone, your strange creation. This phrasing is very evocative of classic monster movies, and we'll learn later on that Lydia and Emily would have been big fans of such stories. When I wanted to conceive of a gothic, macabre, cynical, teen, angst-ridden anthem, it made me think about, you know, my youth learning to play electric guitar really badly in bands in high school and it all being about grunge and rock chunky power chords and that sort of energy and I knew that's I wanted it to be a song that any teen could sit on their bed and play and sing for themselves it's a slap Perfect definitely seems to have accomplished this goal, with new covers of the song appearing on YouTube and TikTok years after the musical's release. Personally, I haven't seen anybody sing this song quite like Sophia Ann Caruso does. Every crack and break in her voice helps portray a girl who is in immense emotional pain, along with the added benefit of capturing the grungy, rock and roll vibe Perfect was going for when he wrote it. Dead Mom is a power ballad to end all power ballads, and it's not only my favorite song of the show, but one of my favorite songs in all of my limited Broadway experience. Peter, Peter, it's a slap. It's a good song, and I don't, I don't even listen to that shit. Meanwhile, in the attic, Beetlejuice intends to teach the Maitlands how to be scary. Don't you want to get these people out of your house? Definitely. Well, then you have to look out. Just scare them. Barbara wonders why Beetlejuice can't scare away the new family himself, but he reminds them that he can't affect the world of the living, but they can. It would give me more pleasure than to kill these people. Kill? Hold on. You do not want to kill. Did you hear your speech? Yeah. Okay, Jesus Christ. During the song Fright of Their Lives, Beetlejuice asks the Maitlands to name things that are scary, which is met with suggestions like Beetlejuice suggests that they use things like jump scares and throwing their voices in order to make the Dietzes see them. Once they have the Dietzes' attention, the Maitlands are supposed to make one of them say Beetlejuice three times in order to free him. After you scare them, while they're still quaking in terror, you make them say this. This is where it's emphasized that for the name to have any kind of power over him, it needs to be spoken by a living person. This detail may seem innocuous, but its absence will be noticeable during the movie. Why make them say it? We just said it a bunch of times. It doesn't matter if you say it, Adam. They have to be alive! I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell. It's just, 
You make Danny so angry. As the song wraps up, Beetlejuice begins to think the Maitlands are helpless, seemingly too sweet and naive to be scary. I want freedom, but to get my freedom, I need them. Get a living person to say my name. I know that they just can't be choosers, until they have to be. He leaves them, but Barbara wants to figure out a way to remove the Dietz family on their own. Adam agrees during a reprise of Ready, Set, and the couple enthusiastically don some bedsheets as they exit the attic. We catch up with Lydia and Delia downstairs, and see more of Delia's questionable life coaching in action. My whole life is a dark room. One big dark room. Well, that's depressing. Delia frequently quotes her guru, Otho, when trying to comfort Lydia. She also gives her a new dress to wear to the business dinner so she'll look less morbid. It says, I'm warm, I'm friendly, and I think about death only in This leads directly into the song No Reason, which greatly expands on Lydia and Delia's relationship compared to the film. During the song, Delia insists that everything happens for a reason, and Lydia just needs to put more positive energy out into the world. In contrast, Lydia has a much more pessimistic and realistic outlook on life. Lydia actually calls out Delia here, referring to all the needless death in the world, singing that positivity is a luxury that few can afford. The song actually gives Lydia justifications for not getting along with Delia, with the original demo going even further in this direction. Well, every cloud has a silver lining, so there's a bright side to my mother dying. Delia leaves Lydia alone, but she's soon joined by Adam and Barbara, who emerge from the attic moaning and wearing bed sheets in their first attempt to be scary. Lydia asks them if they're ghosts, which they confirm before running back upstairs. Lydia believes that this is the sign from her mother that she had been waiting for, so she follows the Maitlands to the attic. Well, Upstairs, the Maitlands remove their sheets and get to know Lydia. You can see us without the sheets. We were told living people ignore the strange and unusual. Perhaps that's because I myself am strange and unusual. Lydia talks about how her mom would have loved to have met real ghosts, and she recollects how they would build haunted houses together during the summer. She loved this. You see these haunted houses in our garage, but in summer, so no one was expecting it. What a crazy concept. I can't believe it. I mean, what is this? I gotta get a selfie with this thing. I'm too fat. Lydia quickly apologizes to the Maitlands for talking about her mom, something that she thinks is necessary because Charles never wants to talk about her. Adam and Barbara comfort her, and the three realize that this is one of the nicest moments they'd all had in a long time. Downstairs, Charles and Delia are just returning from a trip to Pound Town. The two of them discuss how this feels like prostitution, since Delia is being paid by Charles and also sleeping with him. Charles also doesn't like hiding this from Lydia, saying that she needs stability in her life. We can't hide this anymore. Do you understand what I'm proposing? I'm proposing. 
The two are interrupted as Lydia runs in, screaming that the house is haunted and insisting that the ghosts look terrifying. Charles, unable to see the Maitlands, assumes that Lydia is messing around. Lydia discovers Delia in the bed, forcing Charles to admit that they're going to be married. Charles insists that he needs a wife and Lydia needs a mother, while Lydia says that she has a mother and if the Maitlands are haunting this place, maybe that means dead mom is haunting their old house. Lydia, in 24 hours, Maxie Dean will be here to have dinner with our family, and I'd like us to be a family. On the roof of the house, Beetlejuice is singing a reprise of Invisible. He feels hopeless after realizing the Maitlands won't be able to help free him, worried that he's doomed to be trapped in this invisible state forever. In the meantime, Lydia has also made her way to the roof with the intention of leaping to her death. She reads her suicide note aloud, which Beetlejuice overhears and relates to. Lydia notices him, and, thrilled to finally be seen by somebody, Beetlejuice introduces himself. I'm an outcast. We're safe now. Invisible! Well, that makes two of us. Who the hell are you? You can see me! told me of the significance. It will be significant. Say My Name is obviously an important song in the score. The moment when Beetlejuice and Lydia first encounter each other, how are they going to interact? What are they going to say? What's the dynamic like? Well, I can't say it. I'm not a demon. Yeah, I'm not a Yes, let's play it. You know, we took our cue from the film, but we also took our cue from the animated cartoon series that was on when I was a kid, where Lydia and Beetlejuice were sort of more, you know, buddies, you know. Beetlejuice was like a little kind of pet. And we wanted to have that playfulness and to see Lydia's power and to see that they're an equal match for each other and that they can't, Beetlejuice can't kind of swindle her the way he thinks he's going to be able to because on the surface of things, she looks like a little girl. Beetlejuice then possesses the Maitlands, forcing them to say how great he is. Beetlejuice explains that possession can be taught to any ghost in less than one lesson. Congratulations. You plagued yourself. Upon this realization, Lydia pushes Beetlejuice off the roof and tells the Maitlands that she has a new plan. It's the night of Charles's business dinner, and Maxie Dean is present along with his legal team and his fifth wife, a minor character created for the musical whom I love every second of. I sleep in a luggage. Have you met my fourth wife? Oh! <laughs> you can't tell me to me! I'm his fifth wife! Now this is Ted. Uh, Ted, I'm my son! My head has got a body that doesn't quit and a brain that doesn't work! Oh! <laughs> so mean! But it's true. I was kicked in the head by a brother. Lydia arrives in the new dress that Delia gave her, prompting Maxie Dean to ask if Charles had her hidden away because he was afraid Maxie would marry her. A small moment, but an interesting foreshadowing for later in the show.
Lydia suggests that Delia make a toast, but shortly into her speech, she begins to sing uncontrollably. With the exception of Lydia, everyone else joins in, singing and dancing around the table. This is where Deo, the Banana Boat song, comes in. This is a cover of a 1956 song made famous by Harry Belafonte, a political activist and frequent guest on the Colgate Comedy Hour. Oh, well, he was a frequent guest on the Colgate Comedy Hour, the radio program. Uh, Come on. I don't know what the Colgate Hour is. Okay, pass. Okay, well, I don't know if this is gonna help you out at all, but he was also a frequent guest on the Colgate Comedy Hour. Adam and Barbara are apparently fans of his and could be seen in the background puppeteering the partygoers. Fun fact, the song has also been covered by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau while he wore blackface for a high school talent show. Unlike this story, he was not under the control of ghosts at the time. I guess something about the song just makes people lose control. Anyway, moving on. Lydia explains that there are ghosts in the house and they want the deets out. Your current approach could get press too by being the world's least scary haunted house. The Maitlands apologize to Lydia for making things worse, and Lydia, deciding she can't live like this anymore, summons Beetlejuice. I say! With the house free of normies, Beetlejuice announces that the two of them aren't invisible anymore, and the first act comes to a close. Yeah. It's our house now, kid! Yeah! The second act is introduced by Skye, a girl scout with arrhythmia singing about her vulnerable condition as she approaches the house. <laughs> Lydia lets her in, quickly leaving her in the dark to be scared by Beetlejuice. This leads directly into the next song, That Beautiful Sound, another duet between Beetlejuice and Lydia. As various delivery people and solicitors come to the house, we see Lydia and Beetlejuice working in tandem to scare them away, relishing in the sound of their screams. By scaring people, Lydia finally feels seen, and she's free from the condescending adults in her life that would constantly neglect her. Beetlejuice conjures a batch of clones of himself, and they all dance together, celebrating having their own haunted house. <laughs> Beetlejuice explains to Lydia that if she wants to live like a ghost, she's got to obey the rules. And then he presents Lydia with a copy of the handbook for the recently deceased. Lydia's first question is if she can use the book to find her mother, but Beetlejuice says that she's in the netherworld and proceeds to complain about his relationship with his own mother. Lydia is unable to open the handbook since she isn't recently deceased, so she plans to get the Maitlands to open it for her. This is another rule of the universe that is conspicuously absent from the film. Frustrated that he's been abandoned again, Beetlejuice talks with his clones about his plan to escape. I don't want to see you sniffing around her anymore this afternoon. Do you understand? Yes, Boy, have you lost your mind? Because no, no, no. I'll help you find it. In a brief reprise of that beautiful sound, Beetlejuice decides that if he's going to be treated like a demon, he might as well act like one. I'll be a In the attic, the Maitlands worry that Beetlejuice is going to kill somebody, so they even consider chopping off his head until Lydia observes that he'd love that. Let's chop off his head! Yes! Lydia gives the handbook to the Maitlands to open, and they learn that the netherworld is accessible by drawing a door with chalk. Adam follows the instructions, but as soon as the door opens, an invisible force pulls him toward it. This alarms Barbara, who closes the door and the book, declaring that helping Lydia is too dangerous. Infuriated, Lydia leaves after saying the Maitlands are afraid of everything, and that's why they're stuck in the attic.
Barbara takes this criticism to heart as she begins singing Barbara 2.0. As she goes through all of their old belongings, Barbara sings how it's all just a shrine to their old lives where they were meek and indecisive. Now that they're dead, the Maitlands want to release their inhibitions, so they commit to leaving the attic and helping Lydia. Upstairs, Charles and Delia have come back to the house to save Lydia. Ah, no! Delia, it's just the wind. But what if it's Lydia? What if she's possessed? What if Lydia is in my head right now? Delia, there is nothing in your head. Charles! Except brains. Big, beautiful brains. You have a big brain. You have a big brain. You have a big brain. You made it big. Delia was supposed to call an exorcist to get rid of Beetlejuice, but she decided instead to get her oft-quoted guru, Otho. Sweet Jesus, Delia, we need a real exorcist! You saw that monster? Who knows what he's done to Lydia? I thought you'd be proud of me for taking some initiative! As you may know, this character is prominently featured in the movie. Some might argue that he overstays his welcome roughly ten times over, but he's used sparingly in this adaptation to great effect. As a life coach, I have but one enemy. Death? Let me say it! <laughs> Death! I have studied death. I think like death. I spent a long holiday weekend in a red room in winter. Nestled in the hatchback of my Toyota Prius. It's a mysterious object of my own design. It's the perfect weapon to help vanquish your ghost. I call it the Soul Box. Seeing this, Beetlejuice lies to Lydia, saying that she might be able to summon her mom from the box instead. He opens the handbook for the recently deceased to a spell that will supposedly accomplish this, and gives it to Lydia. Quick, let's get that book open! Yeah. She maternal, fate infernal. Yeah, that's the one. As she reads the passage, Barbara begins to be exercised instead. Beetlejuice reveals that this was his plan all along, and in order to save Barbara, Lydia needs to agree to marry him. What? It's a green card thing! What you looking for? Ain't nobody gonna help you out there? Jesus can come through that door and he's not gonna help you if you don't stop sniffing after my child. Lydia says yes, but determined to find her mother, flees into the netherworld with Charles in tow. There is a God. Wandering through the netherworld, Lydia and Charles meet Miss Argentina, a netherworld inhabitant who processes the recently deceased as they enter. This is the netherworld! This is Brazil! This is London, baby! Eagle-eyed viewers may notice that this role is played by whatever actress is also playing Delia at the time. Is it the same woman? Uh, it's the same actress. I don't know if she's supposed to be the same person. Upon learning that Lydia and Charles are still alive, Miss Argentina goes into her song, What I Know Now. Based entirely off of one line the character has in the film, the song is a Latin-infused tango in which Miss Argentina describes how she ended up here. <laughs> While she was alive, Miss Argentina was a beauty queen who spent her life partying to cope with her depression. She would eventually commit suicide, condemning her to an eternity as a civil servant of the netherworld. Had she known this to be her fate, she would have embraced every aspect of her life, the highs and the lows, singing that life is short, but death is super long.
Next up, we meet Juno, another netherworld bureaucrat who eases the dead into the afterlife. After she learns that Lydia and Charles are alive, she tries to have them captured, so Lydia tells Charles to go back home while she ventures deeper into the netherworld. Lost and alone, Lydia calls out to her mother as she sings home. Lydia is terrified that she's going to end up forgetting her mother because Charles is never willing to talk about her. Charles admits that talking about her hurts too much, but realizes that Emily wanted him and Lydia to support each other after she passed. Lydia and Charles reconcile, and the song ends on a hopeful note, with Lydia ready to build a life with the people back home who love her. I cannot talk about it without crying. Back at the house, Beetlejuice is hosting a sadistic game show to torture Otho as Delia and the Maitlands watch. Otho admits that he's a fraud and is removed from the game show and the musical entirely. If only he could be removed from the film so easily. Did Jet just... die? You know, it was really unclear. Lydia and Charles return via chalk door, telling Beetlejuice that Lydia wanted to get her father's blessing before they got married. I told you, Did you think I wasn't coming back? I mean... You literally jumped into hell to get away from me. Mr. Juice. <laughs> I respect your persistence and your moxie. Look at me! I'm crying because I'm so happy. Welcome to the family. Charles welcomes Beetlejuice to the family while the Maitlands 2.0 try to appeal to his horny side, but Beetlejuice remains unconvinced. Since we met, you have pinched me and groped me and harassed me, sir, and I want to tell you in front of all of these people that it has worked! <laughs> I want you, Beetlejuice. I want everyone here to know it. This is all very believable. <laughs> I'm a highly sexual being and I do enjoy an orgy. Y'all don't strike me as the orgy in kind. <laughs> Except this one. <laughs> this one's done some stuff, I can tell. <laughs> Once again, show tunes save the day as Lydia begins her final song with Beetlejuice, Creepy Old Guy. Creepy Old Guy serves a dual purpose, allowing Lydia to convince Beetlejuice that she wants to marry him while also winking at the audience, lampshading how sickening the whole situation is. O-M-G, dressed to a T, fancy and formal, I found me a wife, the high to life, this is so normal. As soon as he says I do, Beetlejuice is brought to life and is overwhelmed with emotions for the first time ever. Those birds? They sound so beautiful. And that makes me feel... Oh God, I actually feel happy! I've never felt this way before! It's amazing! But what if it doesn't last? Oh God, I'm so worried now. Now mortal, Lydia kills him, making him recently deceased. Adam, in the door. Chapter 1! Proceed directly to the netherworld! Beetlejuice is banished to the netherworld, but is stopped by Juno, who berates him and reveals to the audience that she is his mother. Juno intends to bring Lydia back to the netherworld with her, but Beetlejuice protects her, having learned to appreciate life during his brief, 
brief time living in. Juno takes advantage of this newfound vulnerability and tricks Beetlejuice into thinking she was apologizing for his terrible upbringing. Instead, she pushes him out the front door. Juno turns her attention back to Lydia, who has decided that she no longer wants to be dead and wants to build a life with her new family. She's not going anywhere! Back off! Over our dead bodies! Yeah, I'm a part of this too! I don't get it, but I'm a part of it! Juno is ready to kill them all, but Beetlejuice crashes through the ceiling riding a sandworm, which then eats Juno. Check it out, Lydia! Now we both got dead moms! Beetlejuice says his goodbyes to everybody and leaves, teasing that maybe he'll go on a vision quest or find his dad in a potential sequel. Adam, you're bored. You're sexy. Own that. You know what he's not? He's not covered in stupid tattoos and he doesn't have a cigarette for a mother. Barbara, put it there. Now put it here. Ah, where's the shot? Where's the shot? <laughs> Respect. Danica. Delia. We didn't hang out much. Charles! <laughs> you right, old bastard. Never change. I already did change. I changed a lot. <laughs> Then go fuck yourself. I think I'll miss you most of all. Scarecrow. You smell horrible. <laughs> and I know that now. <laughs> well, bye! Tell With Beetle just gone, Lydia invites the Maitlands and Delia to all be a family together. Um, Barbara, do you mind if we all shared this house? Oh, we'd love that! Sorry, it's kind of a mess. Nothing we can't fix. <laughs> well, I'm so happy for all of you. I guess I'll just... I'll just go. Delia! Yes? Did you say something? <laughs> I want you to stay. Just like you said, you don't always get it, but you're a part of it. Echoing the story of when they moved into their first house, the new family cleans up as they sing Jump and Lie. Lydia addresses her mother one more time, embracing her newfound family and singing that she is, at last, Part 2. Beetlejuice, the movie, the movie, the movie. Michael Keaton is Beetlejuice. Liar! The defining difference between the musical and the movie is who we follow as a protagonist. While the musical is primarily focused on Lydia, the film is mostly about the Maitlands. Despite what I had believed based on the marketing for this movie, both Lydia and Beetlejuice will be relegated to ancillary roles. The day will come when you think you're safe and happy, and your joy will turn to ashes in your mouth. That's right, Lydia, the heart and soul of the musical, and Beetlejuice, the titular fucking character, will be sidelined in this movie in favor of an inferior version of the Maitlands and so much Otho. Garbage, okay, give me garbage. We begin by flying over a small town, which is then revealed to be an actual small town being built by Adam Maitland. Adam and his wife Barbara are on staycation, and they exchange gifts of home improvements they plan to make while on holiday. Adam spends his time building a detailed model of the town, while Barbara plans to put up new wallpaper. I'm so glad we're spending our vacation at home. I'm gonna get started right away. Today's gonna be the best day ever! Yeah, yeah! Ain't nothing horrible gonna happen today! You may have noticed that these hobbies aren't allegorical to any kind of latent desire to start a family. That's because this aspect of the Maitland story is mostly absent from the film. It'll be alluded to twice within the first eight minutes, then dropped completely. 
A real estate agent named Jane stops by the house and tries to get the Malins to sell it. She says to Barbara that there's a family in New York that wants to buy the property and that it's too big for just two people, prompting Barbara to make a sad face and Jane to apologize. This indicates that perhaps the Maitlands have tried to have kids before, which is later confirmed as the couple drives to town. Jane leaves and Adam asks Barbara to come with me down to the store, by which he actually means drive me down to the store. The couple drives to town where Adam quickly runs into Maitland hardware. It can be inferred that they own this store, but we actually haven't been told their last name at this point in the movie, so he could also just be stealing from this place. I guess we'd never know. So, just to restate, that is something we'll never know. You're not going to find out later. As the couple heads home, they end up driving off a bridge when they avoid a dog in the road. No, Plopper! If you push that, Daddy will die! They arrive back at the house and try to warm themselves by a fire that has lit itself. Barbara's hand catches a light as the couple realizes they don't know how they arrived at the house. Adam attempts to retrace his steps, but as he leaves, he's teleported to an otherworldly desert, catching a glimpse of a sand snake before he's brought back to Earth. Barbara pulls Adam back into the house and exclaims that he was gone for two hours. Two hours! Oh, Barbara, you are not gonna believe what? That's how long you were gone! Boy, I was gone only... Moments. During his time away, Barbara discovered that she no longer has a reflection. Glad to see that she was using her time wisely while Adam was potentially gone forever. Look, a ghost cop. The couple find the handbook for the recently deceased on an end table and try to learn more about their situation. If I ever find one of these lying around again, I swear to fucking God! I will stop being so polite. Handbook for the recently diseased. Deceased. So smart me. Enjoy books so much. Barbara asks the questions that we all have, like why did Adam disappear when he stepped off the porch, and are we halfway to heaven or halfway to hell? According to the handbook, according to the geographic 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 and temporal perimeters. Functional perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. Smokey, this is not Nam, this is bowling. There are rules. I know this is meant to be unhelpful in the movie, but it ends up coming across as lazy and half Baked. Barbara will go on to say that they can't even get to the garage, so how do they get from the bridge to the house? They weren't processed through the netherworld, did they go through Saturn? They just cheated us! This isn't fair! He didn't get out of the cock a duty car! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell. While the Maitlands read the rules that the writers didn't bother to finish, the camera moves underground where we catch our first glimpse of Beetlejuice. We watch over his shoulder as Beetlejuice reads a newspaper, acknowledging an increase in sandworm activity before turning to the obituaries, which he refers to as the business section. Beetlejuice mutters to himself as he looks for work, eventually spotting the Maitlands and assessing that they look nice and stupid. Cute couple. Look nice and stupid, too. The two of you are special. You die together. That never happens. Unless, of course, it's a murder-suicide, which makes for a very awkward eternity. I really appreciate the writers changing this for the Broadway show. You could tell they played around with a few ideas for how Beetlejuice would come to know the Maitlands, and even the ones left on the cutting room floor are better than what we got in the movie. One early draft in the musical had Beetlejuice haunting a specific piece of land ever since it was a cave. While it isn't canonical, the musical Beetlejuice at least acknowledges that he's been watching the Maitlands for a while, as opposed to them just being a couple of randos that he just happens upon in the obituaries. Also, they're not even the only couple listed! There's an old couple taking up the first slot on the page! What's wrong with them? You don't think some old folks might be easier to manipulate than Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis? So now we have a version of the Maitlands that not only died outside of their house, but they're not even the only people to die together this week! So what is it about the Maitlands that makes them so special? You know what? It's a fair question. Let's do this. Let's put a pin in it. Boop! Pin in. There you go. From the attic, Adam and Barbara see that Jane is back to sell the house, but their attempts to yell down at her are futile. According to the handbook, living people won't see the dead. Barbara clarifies that it specifically says won't, not can't, setting up that there may be exceptions to this. Sometime later, the Maitlands awake to a new family moving into their house. Enter the Dietz family. First, we have Delia and Charles, already married instead of having a secret affair. Charles loves the place and is thrilled at the thought of relaxing in the country, while Delia wants to gut the house and make it her own. Lydia is then carried in on a couch and, seeing Delia's reaction to the house, comments, Delia hates it. I, I could, could live, live here. here. I hope you like these characters in this current state, because they're not going to develop or change at all over the course of this uneventful story. First of all, there's no dead mom in the picture. Does anybody in this movie even love their mom? Mother, 
Lydia makes it clear that Delia is not her biological mother, but we are given zero information as to who her real mother is or the nature of their relationship. We don't even know if her mom is actually dead or if she just fucked off to a more interesting movie. This limits the scope of Lydia's relationship with Delia, having them start off not getting along for generic reasons, then ending with them in separate rooms as Lydia happily dances with her replacement family. Charles also loses an entire character arc, as we have no idea what his first wife was like, we don't know if Lydia resents him for moving on, we don't know anything about this motherfucker except that he needs to relax. Ten minutes. I'm already perfectly at ease. We're here to enjoy the country setting. I'm here to relax. You need to relax. Why don't you guys uh, take a break for about half an hour, okay? Uh -huh. Can't you see I'm relaxing in here? You take it easy up there, big fella. Dad's found a way of making some money while I relax. What is the point of my coming up here if you people won't let me relax? Reign of terror, where pussies go to relax. Or reign of terror, you're probably gonna die. Next we meet Otho, as he climbs in through the window due to a superstition about entering through the front door. Otho's profession here is vague, but he seems to be an interior designer. He and Delia will take charge of the remodeling, which begins with them walking through the house and marking the walls with spray paint. It actually just occurred to me that this scene also breaks the rules of the universe. While touring the house, Otho was the first person to catch a glimpse of one of the Maitlands. At first, I thought this was fine, since Otho was the type of person to be open to the supernatural. However, like 10 seconds later, Otho and Delia open a closet and Barbara is hanging there in an attempt to scare them. Why wouldn't Otho be able to see her if he was able to see Adam just a second ago? This bozo is definitely at least as strange and unusual as Lydia, so what's stopping him from seeing them? If the rules of this movie were a pastry on Bake Off, we'd be dealing with an extremely soggy bottom. <gasps> I've got a soggy bottom! The original reason I wanted to bring up this scene is because it demonstrates another change that the Broadway show made that I love. In the movie, as Delia and Otho are working their way through the house, the Maitlands are attempting to scare them, with Barbara pulling her face off and Adam removing his head. In the musical, the Maitlands are so naive and sweet that they can't even conceive of things that scary, which is a trait of theirs that I really appreciate. As we'll get to later, the movie Maitlands are just too confident for my liking, and it detracts from their story as well as Beetlejuice's. Delia and Otho attempt to enter the attic, but Adam manages to lock the door in time. Otho notices a presence, and Delia jokes that maybe it's the ghosts of the house's previous inhabitants. Frustrated that they're invisible to humans, Barbara attempts to leave the house, but is teleported to the sand snake desert from before. As she's approached by the beast, we get to see the snake in its full stop motion glory. When it goes to attack, Barbara punches it in the nose and it backs off, allowing her and Adam to get back to the real world through the door, which is just hovering there. Let's recap this. A fucking shark coming through the water. And this guy, hey, the fucking shark goes, goes over to this guy, bites. This guy punches it in the face. And a shark goes, all right. You want a good girl. But you need the bad pussy. Back at the house, the family eats some Chinese food, and Lydia uses her second line of the movie to be a little bigot. Planned out a stroke from the amount of MSG that's in this food. Whoa! Pump the hate breaks, Fox and Friends. Eat some fucking shit, you fucking stupid bitch. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, I'm not going to go off on a huge tangent here, but the myths about MSG being unhealthy have been debunked time and time again, and the origin of such myths is deeply rooted in racism. But in the interest of fairness, here's some evidence that MSG might be dangerous. Okay, great, moving on. Now, let's let that hang there a bit, and then we'll address that when we thought things through. At dinner, Charles offers to build Lydia a dark room, teeing up her famous line, my whole life is a dark room, one big dark room. Good news for those who don't want to eat Chinese food, Lydia is serving up her decades old reheated Wednesday Addams impersonation. Why are you dressed like somebody died? Wait. What game? It's called... Is there a god? It has to warm up. Why? So it can kill you. Okay, fine. No more Adam's family comparisons. It's unfair to this movie. Old business is old business, and new business is new business, and this is new business, and we do not discuss new business until... Next quarter. Lydia hears Moody, but for no real reason. If it were me in charge, this is where Delia or Charles would say something like, Lydia, yeah, your mom's dead, ain't it tragic, blah blah, Bible, Jesus, magic. You know, something alluding to anything in the past that may have caused Lydia to be like this. This is where I'd put that line. If I had one! Instead, we just get Delia remarking that Lydia was miserable in New York City, and now you're going to be miserable out here in the sticks. Groundbreaking. 
The scene also features the one singular moment we see of Charles and Lydia interacting in a positive way, with Lydia suggesting that they keep the house as it is, and Charles telling her that he thinks it's a good idea. I guess that means I was wrong when I said the characters are static, since Charles begins with a seemingly positive relationship with Lydia, only to brush her off more and more as the movie goes on. So he regresses! Way to go, bud. Charles tries to relax, but is interrupted as a giant object crashes through the window. Outside, workers are attempting to move Delia's sculptures, large, abstract art pieces she's convinced are great. At one point, Delia is pinned up against the wall by one, foreshadowing it being brought to life during a wedding later on. Also outside is Lydia, who is taking pictures when she spots the Maitlands looking out the attic window. That little girl saw us. I mean, nobody can see us. Yeah, dude, Charles is looking right at me. Stop it. Dude, stop it. You stop playing and stop. Conveniently, Jane arrives shortly after to deliver a single line of exposition and a skeleton key. Lydia immediately takes the key to the attic to attempt to get in, but the Maitlands block the door. The attic TV then turns on and we see an ad for Beetlejuice, dressed as a cowboy and singing about how he'll do anything to get business. Still dealing with Lydia at the door, Adam recalls reading something in the handbook about emergencies. In case of emergencies, the book says to draw a door and knock three times. The couple do this and the magic door opens, bathing the room in green light as the two enter the netherworld. Lydia sees the green light from outside the attic and goes to Charles to try to tell him what just happened. Preoccupied with looking at birds, Charles brushes Lydia off, once again telling her and the audience that he only cares about relaxing. I remind you that in the musical, Charles Dietz is neglectful because he's a widower who's desperately trying to build a new life for his daughter and move forward. Movie Charles literally just wants to stay in one spot. Lydia remarks that maybe, maybe you, you can, can relax in a haunted house, but I can't. Can. What did you become a fucking expert on what I can or cannot do, you fucking weepy willow shit sack? Which feels like a bizarre thing for someone who self-identifies as strange and unusual to say. You're a great big phony, you know that? Later, she'll appear excited to meet real ghosts, even more so at the prospect of them being gross under their sheets. So what is the truth? Are you relaxed around ghosts or not? Jesus fucking Christ, little girl, make up your mind. Meanwhile, Adam and Barbara wander through the netherworld into everybody's second favorite scene, the waiting room. God, how boring is your movie when one of those beloved scenes takes place in a fucking waiting room? The waiting room is full of minor characters who died in amusing ways and are waiting to be processed into the afterlife. There's a magician's assistant who was cut in half, a guy with a shrunken head, a flat guy who got hit by a car, and a few more, all of which equate to nothing more than set dressing. The Maitlands go to the front counter where they meet Miss Argentina. After a frustratingly unclear exchange, Miss Argentina tells the Maitlands that they'll need to meet Juno, their caseworker. They wait for a bit, then Barbara asks that this is what happens when you die. Miss Argentina butts in, saying that everybody's death is very personal, and If I knew then what I know now, I would have had I thing that I say! This one line inspired an entire song in the musical, but in the movie it ends up feeling like such a non sequitur. Like, does Miss Argentina just blurt this out to anybody who comes up to the counter like an NPC in Skyrim? In the musical, she's saying that line to Lydia, a living person who can actually listen to her advice. Miss Argentina tries to warn Lydia not to commit suicide because it's actually something she's been considering doing. The Maitlands are already dead, her advice is meaningless here, and the line ends up feeling like an afterthought even though this is where it originated. The Maitlands are sent down the hall where they come across across a room full of lost souls. Some guy tells the Maitlands that these are souls that have been exercised, which is death for the dead. This is the one part of the story that I'll say the movie does a better job of setting up. Exorcism being death for the dead makes sense, but it's not set up in the musical at all before Barbara starts experiencing it. Good job, movie. You did one thing right. The Maitlands continue down the hall until they end up back in their house, but everything is different. I hope you're ready for a lot of ham-fisted exposition from a character that is ultimately pointless. Juno appears, telling the Maitlands that they've been in the waiting room for three, three months. months. The time dilation in this movie makes absolutely no sense and only serves to raise questions that will never be answered. This will only get more infuriating as the movie continues. Juno says to the Maitlands, Thank God you didn't die in Italy. Which only raises further questions. What's the threshold for how far a ghost can die from their house before they respawn there? Functional perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. What's the difference between dying on the bridge and dying in Italy when regardless of where it happens, the couple still ends up back in their house for no discernible reason. There's no rules! Let's just start back on. There's one rule! Juno then says that haunted houses aren't easy to come by. Again, why are the Maitlands even haunting their house when they didn't fucking die there? It would make sense for haunted houses to be rare if it were only possible if inhabitants died in the house, but if a house can be haunted by people who didn't even die inside, then why are they rare at all? Wouldn't most ghosts choose to haunt their houses as opposed to living in the shitty bureaucracy that is the netherworld? God, I fucking hate this move. So Barbara asks Juno if she should get help from Beetlejuice. Oh yeah, he's in this. But Juno advises against it. She tells the Maitlands that Beetlejuice used to be her assistant until he left to become a freelance bio-exorcist, scaring living people out of their homes. 
dreams. She also tells them that Beetlejuice is currently living inside the model of the town that Adam built. Despite not wanting them to get involved with him, Juno tells the Maitlands that Beetlejuice can be summoned by saying his name three times. It doesn't matter if you say Adam, they have to be alive! Lastly, Juno suggests that the Maitlands remove the Dietzes on their own, and then she disappears like Batman. You don't see my Oh shit! What the hell did he- in the meantime, Charles is on the phone with Maxie Dean, pitching the idea of buying the whole town. Maxie is skeptical about owning a property in the middle of nowhere, but Charles invites him to dinner to see the place. Charles hears moaning at the door and opens it to see somebody underneath a bedsheet. Assuming it's just Lydia, Charles sends her away. It's revealed that it was Adam underneath the sheet, a grown-ass man who is significantly larger than Lydia, but Charles is neglectful, so we can let that slide. The Maitlands continue to wander the house, wearing sheets and moaning to appear scary. Lydia hears this and assumes that there are people having sex and angrily bangs on the wall, saying, a child for God's sakes. What gives, Teddy? We need our sleep. We're so little. Lydia takes her camera and goes out to the hall where she catches the Maitlands. She takes several pictures of them, showing the sheets hovering off the ground with seemingly nobody underneath, and the Maitlands introduce themselves. We were trying to scare your mother. Stepmother. Not my mother, Todd. Lydia asks if they're wearing sheets because they look gross, but the Maitlands explain that nobody else is able to see them, and then they ask why Lydia can. During their time in the netherworld, Lydia broke into the attic and found the handbook for the recently deceased. Even though she very much isn't recently deceased, Lydia manages to open and read the book, deciding that she herself is strange and unusual enough to be able to see ghosts. Of course I can see you. Well, how is it that you see us and nobody else can? Well, I read through that handbook for the recently deceased. I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. It says, live people ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. Lydia admires Adam's model, and the Maitlands ask Lydia to convince her dad that the house is haunted and the ghosts want him out. She agrees, telling the Maitlands that if they want to be scary, they'll need to do more than just wear bed sheets. Lydia attempts to tell Delia about the ghosts, but she is busy preparing to host a dinner for her friends in the art community. Though it was just set up, this is not to be confused with the dinner that the family plans to host for Maxie Dean. Delia insists that they play family just for tonight, not wanting to be embarrassed by the only people from her old life she could get to come out to Connecticut. The Maitlands witness Lydia being brushed off and decide that they need to help her. Back in the attic, Barbara notices light coming from Adam's model and the Maitlands agree to summon Beetlejuice. Summon really isn't the right word here, since when they say his name three times, they're teleported down to the model cemetery. The Maitlands then have to exhume Beetlejuice's grave. A fun depiction is the ground is made of foam and cardboard, and the bio-exorcist finally makes his entrance. When the story of Beetlejuice was first pitched, it had a very different tone. The original version of the character was more violent, and was conceived as a small, Middle Eastern man who would have spoken in African-American vernacular English. What are three other things about him? Hey wait, a dark-skinned, racist character? Did they write this part for Justin Trudeau? Michael Keaton's Beetlejuice may be an improvement over the original version of the character, but he still should have stayed in drafts. Not even the back of the box can make this guy sound appealing, saying, He hurls one-liners, spins into grotesque forms, gobbles insects, and he just can't leave the ladies, living or dead, alone. Here's how I would have ordered those things. I would have said, I'm new in town, and it gets worse. Immediately upon arrival, Beetlejuice grabs Barbara and gives her a big cartoony kiss on the lips. Adam. Babs. Look out for that homeless guy! Open the door! Open the door! Open the door. Why is it time? Just run! He offers to kill whoever the Maitlands want, but when they're not looking to have anybody killed, he offers possession as an alternative. He demonstrates this by throwing his voice into Barbara. The Maitlands tell Beetlejuice that they're just trying to scare some people out of their house, but before they accept his help, they want to know his qualifications. You want somebody out of the house? I want to get somebody out of your house. Oh, I gotta get out of this house. I gotta get out of this house. I'll do anything to get out of this house. I'll suck y'all to get out of this house. This is another aspect of the movie that doesn't work for me that builds off my problem with this version of the Maitlands not being submissive enough. In the musical, the Maitlands are approached by Beetlejuice as soon as they realize they're dead. He manipulates them from the jump, acting as the Maitlands' only resource on how to behave as ghosts. In contrast, the movie Maitlands consult the book constantly, can move freely between the real world and the netherworld, and have been existing as ghosts for months by the time they meet Beetlejuice. The musical Maitlands are too timid to even think to ask his qualifications. For all they know, everybody who dies is guided into the afterlife by this pervert, and it's Lydia who asks for his qualifications. In my opinion, this makes more sense since Lydia is not easily spooked and had already met two ghosts that weren't scary at all. I think this matters because Beetlejuice in the movie has almost nothing to offer outside of introducing the concept of possession. The musical has the Maitlands rely on him as their guide until they meet Lydia, but movie Maitlands get all of their information from Juno. 
I vastly prefer how the musical incorporates Beetlejuice into the story from the beginning, as opposed to the Maitlands approaching him, after specifically being told not to, only to decide not to accept his help. So Beetlejuice tells the Maitlands his qualifications, which include attending Juilliard, Ah, well, I attended Juilliard. I went to Juilliard. And thinking The Exorcist is funny. Ugh, I watched The Exorcist as a comedy, welcome to my twisted mind. Sandworms. You hate him, right? You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. He then makes a scary face at the Maitlands, and Barbara decides they need to leave right away. Barbara accomplishes this by shouting, home, 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 at which point the Maitlands are teleported back to the attic. Home, home, home! Barbara, how did you do that? Home, home, home! Barbara, how did you do that? That answer your question? It does, but it actually brings up a lot of other questions. What in the Wizard of Oz fuck was that? You can't just say whatever you want three times and it happens. That's not how the force works. If that were the case, the Maitlands could just ask for an empty house, or I could ask for a story that makes sense. Having decided not to work with Beetlejuice, Barbara tells Adam her plan to get rid of the Deetses on their own. It's the night of Delia's artsy-fartsy dinner partsy, and oh goody, Otho is back. You know what they say about people who commit suicide? In the afterlife, they become civil servants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm confused as to the relationship here. I mean, what, what, what is he, your ward? You can afford what I'm going to have to do to this place. Remember, I'm schooled in chemistry. After my stint with the Living Theater, I was one of New York City's leading paranormal researchers. I know just as much about the supernatural as I do about interior design. Her job is so confusing. The job isn't important. It's just a generic job that the writers of this made up for this. Lydia tries to tell everybody at the dinner that she's seen some ghosts, but Delia says she's sick of that subject. Suddenly, Delia begins lip-syncing Deo, the Banana Boat song, which appears to be coming out of nowhere. The scene is extremely well-known and beloved, so much so that I wish I could just skip the whole thing. People actually refer to this scene as a musical number, and it makes me sick. Instead of actually being forced to sing the song themselves, the guests at the dinner table begin soundlessly mouthing the words to the song while dancing uncontrollably. This is a minor gripe at this point, but the Maitlands aren't even throwing their voices here, nor are they possessing the group to use their own voices. They're basically Bluetoothing to the dinner guests and throwing Harry Belafonte voice while the victims awkwardly dance around like it's a silent disco. Now think back to the musical. Delia is forced to sing as well as dance, adding to the immediate sense that she's lost control, as well as injecting the scene with so much more energy. More importantly, in the musical, the possession backfires immediately, directly leading to Lydia summoning Beetlejuice. Here, it doesn't work because the possession didn't even occur at the right dinner party. It features a bunch of dinner guests that ultimately don't matter in the slightest, whereas in the musical, this is the big event that Charles has been counting on to impress Maxie. The placement of this event should have been crucial, but because the Maitlands aren't coordinated with Lydia here, it ends up being fruitless except for all them bananas. That being said, it's probably my least favorite song in the Broadway show since it's just a cover song that had to be included because it's synonymous with this property. More than anything, I, j I just want this moment to end. The dance ends as everybody is attacked by their shrimp cocktails, and the Maitlands, who had orchestrated the event, retreat to the attic and wait for the guests to flee in terror. Not only did the Maitlands fail to scare the dinner party, but Delia even requests via Lydia that they come downstairs and introduce themselves. Charles compares the possession to being in an amusement park and speculates that people would pay big money for this. He also has the pictures that Lydia took of the floating bedsheets, which could fetch a reward as proof of life after death. This should be enough to get Maxie Dean to invest in the town, but Delia's guests remain skeptical after the Maitlands refuse to make an appearance. They leave, chalking up their experience to some kind of shared hallucination and roasting Delia on the way out. Delia, you are a flake. You have always been a flake. If you insist on frightening people, do it with your sculpture. The Dietzes and Otho storm up to the attic, demanding that the Maitlands show themselves. Lydia is worried that they scared the Maitlands away and she asks the gang to leave them alone. Charles is impressed by Adam's model of the town, Delia is embarrassed, and Otho believes the Maitlands are still nearby. He then proceeds to take the Maitlands' copy of the handbook for the recently deceased. I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. They all leave the attic and we see that the Maitlands were hanging out the window. Beetlejuice laughs at them for not being scary, now, then says it's time to turn on the juice and see what shakes loose. As the Dietzes are heading back downstairs, Beetlejuice appears them as a snake. Kind of a lot of snakes in this movie, huh? You need the bad pussy. And begins to antagonize them. He grabs Charles, saying, We've come for your daughter, Chuck. Obviously, this is meant to scare Charles, but Beetlejuice's interest in Lydia comes out of nowhere. They share one look, then a few seconds later, Beetlejuice says, I think she can understand me. First of all, this is based on nothing more than a creepy stare. Yeah. What you looking 
for you. Ain't nobody going to help you out there. Jesus can come through that door and he's not going to help you if you don't stop sniffing after my child. And secondly, if he didn't think people could understand him, then why was he understood by Charles just a moment ago? Everybody in the hallway is clearly seen reacting to him, but for some reason he's decided Lydia is the only one he wants to do business with. I don't know, maybe they could have given Lydia and Beetlejuice some similar goals, or allowed them to build a rapport together, instead of him seemingly picking her after a process of elimination. Barbara enters the hall to see Beetlejuice approaching Lydia, and pulls off another one of her skull-fuckingly stupid spells. Seriously, somebody needs to nerf Babs. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Oh, no! By saying his name three times again, Barbara sends Beetlejuice back to the model town. But why? Juno made it seem as though Beetlejuice can go wherever he wants, and he hangs out in the model town by choice. So is he bound to it all of a sudden? No, that can't be right, because Juno put the brothel there to distract it, implying that he could leave once he's bored. And she'll go on to scold the Maitlands because they let Beetlejuice out and didn't put him back. But how does he get put back if not by doing exactly what Barbara just did? Absolutely none of this is made clearer when Juno brings the Maitlands back to her office to lecture them. After he's teleported back to the town, Beetlejuice goes into a brothel that Adam didn't build. Adam, why did you build that? I didn't! The Maitlands are then transported back to the netherworld by Juno, who lets them know that they really screwed up. Juno is pissed because the Maitlands let themselves be photographed, let Beetlejuice out, and let Otho get a hold of the handbook. She goes on to say, cannot let a routine haunting like yours provide proof that there is existence beyond death. But wait a second, she calls their situation routine, but earlier she said that haunted houses aren't, aren't easy to come by. Easy to come by. Routine haunting. Routine haunting. Routine haunting. So which is it, rare or routine? Like I mentioned before, I could see why it'd be rare if people had to die in their own homes in order to haunt them, but as we've established, you can kind of just die anywhere, as long as it's not Italy. There's no rules! Put your shirt back on! There's one rule! If they're not easy to come by, how can they also be routine, Juno? You know? This also raises questions about the rules of the netherworld. In the musical, the handbook tells Ghost to proceed to the netherworld in the first chapter, and it's only because Beetlejuice destroys the book that the Maitlands don't do this. This is presented as something that ghosts have no choice but to do, since anytime the Maitlands are exposed to the netherworld, they're drawn into it. It's also said that everybody who's ever died is down there, further driving home that hauntings are actually rare. By comparison, the movie Netherworld seems more casual, with the Maitlands able to wander around as they please, only traveling there to talk to Juno. By presenting the netherworld as someplace that you don't want to go, the musical raises the stakes of the story. Lydia also has a reason for wanting to travel to the netherworld, instead of it just being an optional destination. The scene concludes with Juno being interrupted by a bunch of dead footballers and none of these concerns being addressed. Coach, where's the men's room? Men's room? Are you kidding? It's the night of the Maxi Dean dinner, and back at the house, Charles, Delia, and Otho discuss how to capitalize off their ghost situation. At the same time, Lydia is now drafting a suicide note. When compared to the musical, the scene comes out of nowhere. Movie Lydia has been neglected, sure, but there's no real inciting incident for her deciding to kill herself. At this point in the musical, Lydia has been mourning her dead mom for months now, and has just discovered that her neglectful father is going to be remarried to an incompetent life coach. This discovery is immediately followed by her scene on the roof. In the film, the last time we saw Lydia was when the whole family was harassed by Beetlejuice in the stairwell. We have no idea how much time has passed since then, because the next thing we see is the Maitlands in the netherworld, and because the writers insisted on having this bullshit time dilation while they're in there, the last events with Lydia could have happened fucking months ago. Okay, so Lydia wants to die. So do I at this point in the movie. In her suicide note, Lydia plans to jump off the Winter River Bridge. From one professional to another. Pick up that spot from this height. Oh, wouldn't kill me. What is so special about this bridge? First of all, it's like 10 feet above the river. Kids probably would jump off that shit every summer, but whatever. The fall already killed the Maitlands, but that just raises further questions. If so many people are dying on this bridge, why is it still operational and not itself haunted? And what's the deal with this dog? Is he some sort of Grim Reaper hellhound? Guess what? Now this is happening. What are you doing? That's how I roll. Luckily, it doesn't matter because Lydia was never going to go through with it anyway. Wasn't going to jump. You're a phony. Hey, everybody. This guy's a great big phony. Juno tells the Maitlands that they need to get rid of the Dietz's family now. But why? Juno is already mad that the Maitlands are terrible at being ghosts, so why would she want them to continue to attempt to scare the Dietzes? The previous attempts to do so have not only failed, but they have made things worse every time. The real world has proof of the afterlife already, so wouldn't further interactions with the Dietzes only risk giving them more evidence? Juno asks the Maitlands how they plan to accomplish this, ignoring the fact that she earlier told them that there's no point in pulling your heads off for people if they can't see you. Not bad. 
Not bad. It obviously doesn't do any good to pull your heads off in front of people if they can't see you. The Maitlands disfigure themselves, which is a fun visual, but again, it doesn't make any sense since they still won't be able to be seen by anybody except for Lydia. Speaking of Lydia, we catch up with her as she looks for the Maitlands in the attic, presumably to tell them about her plan to jump off the bridge. Instead, she finds Beetlejuice in the model town, and the two finally have an actual conversation. Beetlejuice says that Lydia looks like somebody he could relate to, then proceeds to not actually relate to her at all. In the musical, Lydia and Beetlejuice are both invisible and powerless. Beetlejuice meets her right as she's about to commit suicide, and during Say My Name, he convinces her that if she works with him, they'd be able to hurt Charles more than they would if she just dies. Beetlejuice knows Lydia has a goal, and he offers to help her accomplish it. In the movie, Lydia has no agency or motivations or backstory, so she just does whatever Beetlejuice asks of her. I'll remind you that this is the last version of the Beetlejuice story that I ever experienced. Every other piece of media involving this character seems built on the relationship between Beetlejuice and Lydia. Not since the last Woody Allen movie have you been so excited to see an old man hit on a young girl. Dear Evan Hansen, she's too young for you, bro. If she got a basket on her bicycle, she's too young for you, man. If she still has the parental controls on her TV in her bedroom, she's too young for you, bro. If she only owns Snow White on DVD, she's too young for you, Yo, man. If his kids still light up, he's too young for you, bro. <laughs> well, strap the fuck in. You paid for the whole seat, but you only need the edge. Look down at your knuckles. They are most definitely white, because what follows is an incredibly boring conversation in which Beetlejuice cheats at charades and Lydia almost summons him incorrectly. Yeah, you know, I this guess is, if I tell you, you tell your friends. Is, your friends are calling me on the horn all the time. Is, They're going to show up at shopping. What? This is boring. Delete. Beetlejuice tells Lydia that he wants out, and she can help him if she says his name three times. Lydia says that she wants to be dead, but Beetlejuice doesn't actually say anything to convince her otherwise, just saying that if he gets out, maybe we could talk or something. Off screen, he apparently offers to take Lydia to the netherworld to find the Maitlands, but we don't actually see that part of the exchange. Lydia asks his name, and Beetlejuice gives a long-winded answer for why he can't just tell her, then they play charades for her to figure it out. Lydia figures out his name and Beetlejuice tries to get her to keep saying it, reacting as though she's close despite the fact that his name wasn't spoken unbroken. Beetlejuice? Yes, that's it! Name's Beetlejuice? Ah, you said it twice, just say it once more, come on. the whole world gone crazy? Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the rules? Three times in a row it must be spoken unbroken. It's almost like this awkward scene could have been conveyed much more conveniently through a song that also demonstrates that the characters are an equal match for one another. But what do I know? Adam and Barbara return from the netherworld in their monster disguises. Barbara has decided based on her very limited interactions with Lydia that she wants to stay with her. The Maitlands enter the attic and interrupt Lydia before she can finish summoning Beetlejuice. Lydia explains that she thought Beetlejuice would help her find the Maitlands because she wants to be dead like them. Barbara tells her that being dead doesn't make things any easier and that's all it takes to turn Lydia away from considering suicide. The Broadway show actually put effort into writing Lydia's character, giving her a multitude of valid reasons to consider suicide, whether it be escaping her oblivious family, sending a message to her father, or reuniting with her dead mom. The musical also succeeds here because Lydia is the one who traveled in the netherworld instead of the Maitlands. She goes there by choice, which is what prompts Miss Argentina to do a literal song and dance to convince Lydia that it's a bad idea to throw her life away. Lydia's entire story arc is spent learning to accept that her mother is gone but appreciate that she still has people who love her back home and that life is worth living. Compare that with the movie, where she comes to her decision to commit suicide seemingly out of nowhere, then is talked out of it just as quickly a few minutes later. Not to mention, the person telling her that being dead isn't easy has like the most lax experience as a ghost ever. Barbara's only obstacle since dying has been an inability to clean, but she's going to act like she's been around the block a few times and can relate to Lydia's struggle. Barbara goes on to say that she and Adam would like to invite Lydia and her family to stay. The ghosts are going to invite the humans to stay. <laughs> what? You two are the ones who shouldn't be here, you fucking no rules having undead squatters. The fuck are you going to do to remove them from the house if you didn't decide to coexist, you fucking pathetic pansy ass fruit fuck? So Charles and Otho remove the model from the attic to use in the presentation for Maxie Dean. Charles is pitching a paranormal amusement park, but Maxie remains unimpressed and wants to see the ghost that he was promised. In the old hardware store. We can't lose! Your current approach could get press too by being the world's least scary haunted house. Yeah, I don't think that's the approach we want. But. Well, that's the approach it seems like you're currently taking. Lydia tells them that the ghosts left because they don't want to be teased or forced to do silly tricks. The group turns to Otho, who reveals the handbook and says he can summon the Maitlands if he has something personal of theirs. Delia remembers the wedding clothes they found in the closet when they first arrived, and the group prepares to do a seance. Wait, what am I worried about? Oh, so you can't even change a tire. 
This last bit all happens pretty fast, so I'm gonna go through it first, then cover my qualms. Otho leads the group in a ritual to summon the dead. Barbara appears first, alarming Adam as she turns incorporeal and appears on the table in her wedding dress. Adam soon follows, and the couple begins to age rapidly in front of the group. Lydia pleads for them to stop the ritual, but Otho says it's too late. She goes to the model and asks Beetlejuice to save the Maitlands, which he agrees to do if she'll help him in return. In order to be freed permanently, Beetlejuice says he needs to be married, likening his situation to that of an illegal alien. Lydia reluctantly agrees, and she says his name three times. Beetlejuice. 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 It's showtime. I feel like I'm gonna explode here! Ugh. Beetlejuice emerges from the model town, now visible and at his full size. This delights Maxie and his wife, whom Beetlejuice then dispatches via carnival game. Otho runs away, leaving just the Dietz and Maitland families. Beetlejuice brings Delia's sculptures to life and they tie up Charles and Delia. He then summons a demonic pastor to perform the wedding. Beetlejuice says, I do, but Lydia tries to object, leading him to cover her mouth and speak for her. The Maitlands, now back to their normal age, attempt to say Beetlejuice's name again, which he hinders with magic before teleporting Adam to the model and sending Barbara to Saturn. As Beetlejuice fumbles with the wedding ring, Adam commandeers a car and drives it into Beetlejuice's foot. Barbara then comes crashing through the ceiling riding a sandworm which eats Beetlejuice. How did she get there? Oh my god, Morty, how did she get there? Everybody is released from Beetlejuice's magic, the pastor disappears, and we fade to black. Would you believe that I have problems with this? Let's go back to the seance. The group wants to see the Maitlands, but the Maitlands are already visible to the living, as evidenced by them hiding when the Dietz has entered the attic, and by Juno treating them like they're now visible. I don't think it makes sense, but that's what this movie gets off on. Maybe the redundancy of the spell is what turns the ritual into an exorcism. The point is that all of this is set up and executed so much more effectively in the musical. First of all, in the musical, the ritual is conducted by Lydia, not Otho. Lydia is ready to do anything to be reunited with her mother, and Beetlejuice manipulates her into thinking that the spell will accomplish this. Since the handbook could only be opened and navigated by the recently deceased, Beetlejuice is able to pick the specific spell that he needs and tells Lydia that it's the right one without her knowing any better. It's Lydia that wants to summon her mother, it's Lydia's mistake that puts Barbara in danger, and it's Lydia's choice to marry Beetlejuice to rectify this. The movie takes time to show Beetlejuice acting as if the wedding is legitimate, summoning a pastor and making sure there are witnesses. He said earlier that these aren't his rules, but then he speaks for Lydia in the vows, making it clear that the whole thing is a sham. So whoever made the rules decided that you need to get married to get back to the world of the living, but the wedding can be completely non-consensual? In the musical, Lydia actually needs to trick Beetlejuice since even he's skeptical when she says yes. She agrees to marry him, like truly consents, because she plans to bring him to life and then kill him. Creepy Old Guy is an important song because it shows that Lydia has a plan, her family is in on it, and that Beetlejuice is falling for it. Instead of any of that interesting stuff, the movie resolves this so abruptly that it feels like a joke. Time for some maths! How did she get there? <laughs> is that something we should be concerned about? Time to learn maths. So, Barbara has been sent to Saturn, and we're shown that there's a sandworm nearby. If you compare the time that she was there to Adam's first attempt to leave the house, you'll start to see some problems. The shot of Adam in the desert was 8.5 seconds long, while Barbara is shown there for 5. Barbara pulls Adam out and says that he was gone for 2 hours. For the sake of simplicity, let's call Adam's segment 8 seconds long, which would mean that 4 seconds equals an hour, with each second on Saturn equating to 15 real world minutes. This is Stay with me, these, these aren't are my rules. rules. Barbara is on Saturn for 5 seconds which should mean that she'd be out of the picture for an hour and 15 minutes. However, she instead returns mere moments after being sent there, with seemingly the same amount of time passing for all parties involved. I've got some maths for you, sir. Plus equals... No, that's not true. That's not what maths equals. You're making maths into a bad joke. Also, how the fuck did she manage to take control of a sandworm? Yeah, I punched your shark in the face. He tried to get away, grabbed him, punched him again. I said, I grabbed him by the, th the big throat. I said, fuck you, shark. Well, the water was outside. I was like, fuck you, shark. Because the water was in my mouth. There's no time to be concerned with any of that because we've entered the denouement of this disaster. We cut to Lydia as she bikes home from school. Adam and Barbara are able to move about the house freely, and it seems as though they've gone back to their lifestyle from before they died. Lydia takes pictures of the town that Adam references when building his model. Lydia got an A on a math test that the Maitlands helped her study for, so they celebrate by taking control of the furniture. Charles 
overhears the celebration from his office, and Delia scares him with a sculpture of Beetlejuice. Lydia levitates and dances to jump in line as we move into the waiting room and find Beetlejuice. He tries to skip the line, leading him to getting his head shrunken. Back at the house, Lydia continues to dance and hover, now backed up by projections of the dead footballers that she never met. Credits. Um... I'm upset! What the fuck happened? Do you have a question, Kelly? Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Number one, how dare you? Uh, where's the rest? What happened to the character development? What happened to the heartfelt story of a young girl accepting her mother's death? Where was the cathartic moment of reconciliation between her and her neglectful father? Where was the demon learning to appreciate the value of life? Where was the adorable couple that couldn't start living until after they died? Where was the big happy family at the end? Where was anything? That's not enough, Dad! Where's the rest? Where is the rest? This case is empty. The opposite of full. This case is supposed to be full! What the hell am I supposed to do with an empty case? Can you hear the empty spaces? I hope you're hungry. For nothing. I absolutely cannot believe that such an excellent musical could be made from such shitty source material. It's a kernel. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's how you tell the story that makes it good. How you told the story was by far the worst part of the story. This movie is beloved. I get it recommended to me as an 85% match anytime it's on a streaming service. People want to watch it every Halloween and I want none of it. Maybe there's a good movie in here somewhere. Right, 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 right. But like, where was it though? because that motherfucker was gone. It blows my mind that this movie is classified as a horror comedy by containing the bare minimum of each. I knew this musical would obviously have added some things, but I never expected that they had to rework this unfinished story from the ground up. Well, now that I've seen the movie, I understand why. Fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Hey, old girl, let's get you finished. Part 3. Beetlejuice, the characters, the characters, the characters. So we've covered the story, but story isn't everything. Which version of Beetlejuice does a better job of doing these characters justice? I'm no expert. I'm barely even an amateur. I don't know what any of this shit is, and I'm fucking scared. But I think I can identify poorly written characters when I see them. At the very least, I can tell which is better when two versions are placed side by side. And let me tell you, the musical wins every time. I think that depends on what you're... No, no. Wasn't a question. Isn't it subjective? No. Several characters in this video are seen portrayed by more than one actor. This may not be ideal, but I do think that it strengthens the argument that it doesn't matter who plays these characters, what matters is how they're written. Let's start with the Maitlands. In the movie, we meet the Maitlands on vacation, during which they don't even plan to leave the house. Another character tells them that they should start a family, and the most we get by way of Barbara's opinion is a sad look. Adam will go on to say that they could try again, but this reads more as him wanting to pork his wife than him having any desire for a child. Sure, it could be both, but given that the conversation was prompted by a third party, it makes it seem as though it wouldn't have come up were it not for Jane. What I'm getting at here is that a desire to start a family is certainly not core to their characters. Their primary goal throughout the movie is to keep their house. This isn't a challenge for them as they respawn there even after dying on the bridge, the downside being that they can't leave. Other than not wanting to cohabitate with the Dietzes, they don't seem to have any objections to being trapped in the house. They go to the Netherworld world on their own and are under no obligation to stay there. When they meet Lydia, they're cordial, but they don't connect with her in any significant way. They meet Beetlejuice, but he has nothing to offer and has no leverage over them. They learn to control their ghost powers, using them one time and accomplishing nothing. They don't even manage to make things worse in any meaningful way. They're chewed out by Juno when she tells them to get rid of the Dietzes, which they don't do, but they face no consequences. They then decide to invite the Dietz family to live with them, but we've seen that they're incapable of getting rid of the Dietzes, so this isn't so much a decision as it is their only other option. Then, they're almost executed exercised due to the actions of a character to whom they have no connection, Otho, only to be saved by a character with whom they've barely spoken, Lydia. In return, they save Lydia through bullshit means, then basically replace Charles and Delia as her parental figures. What the fuck is this, Matilda? Oh, that's why this ending is so familiar. And doing perhaps the first decent thing they ever did for their daughter, the Wormwood signed the adoption papers. You're not gonna be calling us for support payments or something like that, huh? And Matilda found, to her great surprise, that life would be fun, and she decided to have as much of it as possible. And Matilda never had to use her powers again. Well, I mean almost never.
Let's compare these guys with the Maitlands in the musical. Here, the Maitlands are at the end of a 10-year plan that they've clearly spent the majority of trying to prepare themselves for a child. They've constantly found reasons not to commit to starting a family, instead opting to improve themselves and their life together before bringing somebody else into it. When they die, they don't receive the handbook and are forced to rely on Beetlejuice to teach them how to be scary. He loses faith in them, but then they meet Lydia, with whom they connect immediately. They're the only people Lydia is able to talk to about her mother, and they can see right away that she's been neglected. Adam even makes dad jokes to drive home the fact that he wants a child and is able to identify with Lydia instantly. When they possess the dinner guests to try to scare them away, it has the opposite effect, making things so much worse that Lydia's only remaining option is to summon Beetlejuice. After they refuse to help Lydia with the handbook, she calls them out, saying that they're afraid of everything and that's why they'll never escape the attic. This gets through to them as the Maitlands commit to reinventing themselves now that they're dead, no longer to be held back by the excuses that stop them from living. As Beetlejuice prepares to kill them all in the third act, both Maitlands are in on Lydia's plan, and they all work together to get rid of him. Lydia then invites the Maitlands to share the house, not the other way around, making it that much more cathartic that the Maitlands finally have the family that they've always wanted. That was an arc. See the difference? Delia and Otho. In case it wasn't clear, I'm putting these two together because in the movie they're attached at the hip, and in the musical, Otho is mostly unseen. Delia is the first of the Deeds family we see enter the house. She's already married to Charles and she thinks of herself as an artist. Hello, you've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Her and Otho, an interior designer, for now, plan to remodel the house so she can express herself. She's often dismissive towards Lydia and shows no desire to ever be close to her. Kids! <laughs> you know, I love them. After they're possessed at Delia's dinner, she and Otho become very interested in the idea of ghosts haunting the house. It's revealed that Otho was once considered one of New York City's leading paranormal researchers, and he knows that Maxie Dean's wife loves the supernatural. Why does he know this? Is he cucking Maxie Dean and Charles? They try to find the ghost in the attic and Otho steals their handbook. They're harassed by Beetlejuice and Delia gets away mostly unscathed, while Otho is yeeted down the stairs but is perfectly fine the next morning. When the Deans have come to dinner, they want to see the ghosts they were promised. Lydia says that they're gone, but Delia is quick to disregard her, summing up my problems with the movie pretty nicely by saying, Don't worry, we're not relying on her. We have... Otho. Delia produces some of the Maitland's clothes, and Otho performs a seance. He successfully calls upon the Maitland's, but the ritual goes wrong and he loses control. Once Beetlejuice is summoned, Otho escapes and Delia is wrapped up by one of her sculptures, sidelining her for the rest of the wedding. When Beetlejuice is eaten, Delia gives the Maitland's an awkward, sorry my bestie and I tried to destroy you, but I guess we're gonna share a house now smile, and the scene fades out. The last time we see her, she's scaring Charles with a sculpture that she's made in Beetlejuice's likeness. She's also wearing black and white stripes. Damn, does Delia want to fuck Beetlejuice? I guess that's a topic for a different essay. Delia in the movie is a more self-assured character. She's one of those classic Catherine O'Hara caricatures that we can't help but cherish. Unfortunately, I think that makes the movie version of Delia less interesting. Here, she has friends willing to visit her, she has an Otho to provide her with near-constant validation, she already has a husband, and she has nothing to gain from getting closer to Lydia. The only thing she seems to learn over the course of this movie is to scare people with her sculptures. If you insist on frightening people do it with your sculpture. Musical Delia is almost completely different and she's better for it. First of all, her secret affair with Charles is infinitely more compelling than the standard marriage we see in the movie. Their constant horniness for each other is not only funny, but it sets them up to be caught by Lydia, which will damage their already fragile relationship with her. Delia here is gullible and ditzy, much more a follower than a leader. She quotes Otho all the time, which shows us that she will blindly follow him, but also tells us that he's one of the few people to accept her. We learn in the bridge to no reason that Delia has been abandoned by family before, and in an exchange with Charles we learn that she's been rejected by bands and religious groups as well. constantly trying to connect with Lydia not only because it's her job as a life coach, but because she legitimately wants to be part of a family. When Otho shows up in the musical, he and Delia are close, but he's quickly revealed to be a fraud and is removed from the show. His brief appearance is fun, and it sets up Beetlejuice to trick Lydia. That's 
it. In the movie, Otho's frequent presence raises issues beyond me just finding his character to be annoying. He doesn't only provide validation to Delia, but to Lydia as well. In the musical, Lydia is the only one interested in the Maitlands. This adds to her feeling of being gaslit when Charles and Delia can't see them and is one of the primary factors leading up to her suicide attempt. In the movie, Otho usually is the one to ask Lydia about the ghosts, making him seem like somebody Lydia could definitely turn to as a last resort if nothing else. Damn it, Otho, stop relating to her, she's supposed to be utterly alone! Throughout the movie, Otho takes agency away from Lydia by performing actions that should have been done by her, and his history with the paranormal makes Lydia seem less strange and unusual by comparison. He's supposed to be a paranormal expert, but his negligence almost gets the Maitlands killed and Lydia married to a pervert. You know, they're the real villains of this show. Charles! As I covered roughly 8,000 words ago, Charles in the movie is here to relax. With no affair to hide from Lydia and no dead wife to mourn, Charles has got it pretty good. He relaxes his way through the story, ignores Lydia unless she's going to be useful to him, and basically just watches as the events of the movie happen around him. His story begins with him wanting to relax and ends with him finally being able to. What a succinct, satisfying little arc for him. I'm fucking with you, that was awful. I'm saying there's no arc, okay? The musical actually thought to make Charles matter. As a real estate mogul, Charles is actually the one to take charge of remodeling the house in order to impress Maxie Dean from the start. He's also a widower here, and he mourns his late wife by constantly trying to move forward. He hired Delia to help guide Lydia through the mourning process so he wouldn't have to. He seems to have Lydia's best interests in mind, but he doesn't think she's resilient enough to know the truth about his relationship with Delia. When the group is possessed at dinner, it briefly seems as though Charles is going to capitalize on the situation, but as soon as Beetlejuice is summoned, that plot thread is dropped in favor of him saving Lydia. When Lydia travels to the netherworld, Charles follows her without hesitation. The two reconcile with Charles promising Lydia that they could talk about Emily whenever she wants. If Charles had gone back home when she told him to, Lydia wouldn't have been able to return from the netherworld. Back in the land of the living, Charles is part of Lydia's plan to trick Beetlejuice, and he welcomes him into the family as if he's given his blessing to their marriage. His story ends as he dances with his daughter and in the new family that they've chosen together. Surely this doesn't require much explanation. Charles in the musical actually builds his relationship with his daughter throughout the story. Charles in the movie could be removed entirely and absolutely nothing would change. At the end of the musical, Charles even tells Beetlejuice, I've changed a lot, something that movie Charles could never claim. The only thing movie Charles would go on to do is hunt John Leguizamo in the pest. Lydia Dietz. I know I've covered Lydia throughout the whole project, so I'll try to keep this brief. Lydia in the movie is gloomy and distant from her family for no particular reason. We do not know if her real mom is dead or if they were even close. The most we can infer is that Lydia likes her real mom more than Delia. She has no significant connection to Delia, nor does she go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her like she does in the musical. She's strange and unusual enough to see the Maitlands, but not so much so that she can relax in a haunted house. When she meets the Maitlands, she's excited, but it's not a life-changing event for her like it is in the musical. It's important that Lydia is the only one in the family to take an interest in the supernatural because she's shared that interest with her dead mom. Everybody else thinks she's weird, that's like the whole point of her missing her mom and connecting with Beetlejuice. Movie Lydia spends a bunch of time trying to tell everybody that the house is haunted. I told them you were too mean to be afraid. You actually told them she was too fucked up on Valium to be scared. I've seen this a ton of times! But as soon as they take an interest, Lydia says they need to leave the ghosts alone. There are moments in this film where she cares less about the fact that there are ghosts nearby than anybody else in the house. In the musical, she's been enamored with the concept of hauntings her whole life, first by bonding with her mother over them, then by seeing them as a chance to reunite with her. When she meets the Maitlands, it's right after she's been asking her dead mom for a sign that she's being heard. She spent her childhood connecting with her dead mom over haunted houses and scary stories, so it's that much more significant that she comes into contact with ghosts at that moment. After being ignored by Charles and Delia for months now, Adam and Barbara are the first people to really see her. Lydia feeling invisible is essential for when she meets Beetlejuice. She's completely alone and Beetlejuice literally needs to talk her off of a ledge. In the movie, sure, she wrote the suicide letter, but never for a second did it feel like she was actually gonna go through with it. And this time, I mean it! In the musical, she goes to jump several times during Say My Name, with Beetlejuice stopping her and burning her suicide note. She also has the added motivation of wanting to reunite with her dead mom, even if it means she herself needs to go to the netherworld. Everything that happens in the musical happens because Lydia wants to reunite with her mother. By the end of the story, she's been to Helen back and has learned to accept her mother's death and appreciate life and the people who love her. In the movie, things happen around Lydia, not because of her. Even when she and the Maitland share a goal of wanting to scare her family, she doesn't actually work with them to help facilitate that. In the movie, 
movie, Barbara decides to possess the dinner party after meeting Beetlejuice without consulting Lydia. In the musical, Lydia works with the Maitlands during the possession scene, giving instructions as they take control of different items in the house. Lydia working with the Maitlands for this event matters because it's that much more meaningful when the plan fails and she has to resort to summoning Beetlejuice. It doesn't help that Lydia's connection with the Maitlands in the movie is barely established. When they're being exercised, Lydia could just as easily want to save them just to stop their suffering. Even the other people at the table want to stop it. She agrees to marry Beetlejuice to save the Maitlands, then objects immediately and Beetlejuice speaks for her. In the musical, Lydia agrees to marry Beetlejuice to save one of the only people she's connected with since her mom died. She pulls a bait and switch right away, first escaping into the netherworld, then returning with another plan. She marries him because she knows that will bring him to life, therefore making him vulnerable. In the film, Lydia has no agency, and she's forced through the wedding as Barbara saves the day in a way that shouldn't have been possible. In the musical, Lydia has a plan that utilizes rules that have been established over the course of the story. The movie, by comparison, has no consistent rules to turn against Beetlejuice, causing the entire finale to feel unearned and rushed as hell. To put a bow on it, Lydia and her replacement parents dance to celebrate the fact that the movie is coming to an end. Does Lydia plan to keep her mother's memory alive with the support of her previously neglectful father? Has she finally learned to appreciate the highs and lows of life? After feeling invisible for so long, does Lydia at last feel seen by the world around her? Nah, but she got an A on a math test. Lawrence Beetlejuice. Now what makes you mad more than anything in the world? Billy. You. You're tacky and I hate you. When Beetlejuice the movie was first released, it received mostly positive critical reception because apparently the bar was on the ground. A common criticism of the movie was that Beetlejuice himself didn't get enough screen time, while Roger Ebert would say that Beetlejuice's scenes didn't fit with the other action. You know what they call this even more awesome? Creators of the musical seem to take critiques such as these to heart, as Beetlejuice is interwoven throughout the entire story. Who'd have thought it'd be a good idea to have the character whose name is on the marquee actually be present for the majority of the production? This isn't to say that I actually want any more of Michael Keaton's Beetlejuice. To me, Keaton's Beetlejuice being your favorite version of the character is like Jack Nicholson being your favorite Joker. Just because he did it first doesn't mean he did it best. Maybe you plebes let Tim Burton cast all of your favorite versions of villains, but I'm different. Is Johnny Depp your favorite Willy Wonka too? Stupid straw man, you make me sick. Beetlejuice spends most of the movie in the background. We meet him as soon as he learns about the Maitlands dying and he decides to target them for reasons. I hate when people say that, definitely replace that line. Don't keep it in and then read this part out loud like it's part of the script. Fuck! Maitlands become aware of Beetlejuice through a flyer that was in the handbook. Did Beetlejuice somehow put that specifically in their copy? Does he take out advertising in every handbook? Doesn't matter. The Maitlands meet Beetlejuice and even though he apparently needs them, he makes no effort to be likable. Are we supposed to like this guy? Probably not. It's complicated. Beetlejuice is clearly meant to be off-putting. He is a demon, after all. The problem is that Beetlejuice in the musical is an overdramatic little scamp, and Beetlejuice in the movie is a disgusting asshole nobody would ever want to work with. I'm Bender. You know, the lovable rascal. Look out for that homeless guy! Open the door! Open the door! Open the door. There isn't time! Just run! He's not given the chance to be much of anything else. As an audience, we're supposed to be like, he's funny because he's gross, but we'd never have any reason beyond that to empathize with him. His motivations don't extend past let, Let me, me out. out, and he's not actually good at manipulating people into doing his bidding. Beetlejuice in the musical is more charming, helping him appeal to the audience and the people he's actually trying to string along. When he meets the Maitlands, he's been watching them for a while, and it's heavily implied that he doesn't have any other options until he meets Lydia. This leads to him actually having a plan that he starts putting into place as soon as the Maitlands die. He knows that if they read the handbook, they're going to go to the netherworld and be of no use to him, so he gets rid of the handbook. He knows the Maitlands don't want to lose their house and their possessions, so he tells them he can help them scare away the Dietzes. The Maitlands agree to help him, but they're incapable of being scary, leading Beetlejuice to briefly lose hope until Lydia comes along and is able to see him. This is another important detail. Beetlejuice in the musical is actually invisible until he's summoned by a living person. Usually living people can't see him, meaning that he needs to get a ghost to act as a bridge between him and somebody who can help him. He can't just directly ask somebody to say his name, he's typically dealing with another degree of separation between him and who he actually needs to work with, until he meets Lydia. He relates to her because she also feels invisible, and this is most likely the first time he's ever been able to directly interact with a living person without having been summoned. In the movie, the Maitlands have power over Beetlejuice despite the fact that they're dead, and they're the 
the ones to unleash him. When he attacks the is in the stairwell, everybody can see him. In case you're wondering, no, they're not just reacting to an invisible force that's picking them up while only Lydia can see Beetlejuice. We know this because Charles describes them being attacked by a wild creature, and Delia will go on to sculpt Beetlejuice in his snake form. So Beetlejuice here is not invisible. He can ask anybody, dead or alive, to summon him, and once again making Lydia a less important part of the story. We as an audience have no idea if there's any difference between the Maitland summoning Beetlejuice or Lydia doing it. He only uses Lydia for the marriage, but other than the convenience of her being local, it doesn't seem to matter that he's married to her specifically. He chose the Maitlands out of the newspaper, implying that he could have chosen any newly dead person as his target. So why couldn't he just find somebody to marry him in the classifieds? If I were to concede that he's stuck on this piece of land, what would be stopping him from becoming a snake again, grabbing whoever's closest, throwing his voice into them for a marriage ceremony, then escaping out into the world? The musical avoids these questions because they made the rules of the universe extremely clear. The movie's rules by comparison are muddled at best and completely absent at worst. So Beetlejuice in the musical is more likable, so what? Who cares if he's funny or motivated or good at his job? Because those traits make him a more relatable character and a better foil to Lydia. That's why. He's able to mislead the Maitlands very easily, so you might think he'd be able to do the same to Lydia, and he thinks so too. Movie Lydia with her obnoxious puppy dog eyes might fall for that shit, but not my Lydia. Lydia in the musical is Beetlejuice's equal, not his victim or his subordinate. Beetlejuice gets close to her not only because she summoned him, but because they develop a bond over their mutual interests and goals. When he gives her the handbook, Lydia's primary goal of getting her mom back comes screaming back back into focus, and even Beetlejuice is surprised that she doesn't want to keep hanging out with him. He's been abandoned by everybody in his life, and this motivates him to behave like the demon the world sees him to be. Since Lydia can't open the handbook and the Maitlands won't help her, Beetlejuice tricks her into thinking she can get her mom back. He intentionally misleads Lydia so she puts Barbara in danger. It doesn't just start happening because some dillweed got a hold of the book. When he's married, it's not just because of some vague rule that says that's what he needs to do to be free. It's specifically set up that getting married will bring him to life, meaning that he'd no longer be a ghost, meaning that he'd no longer need to worry about the sandworm stopping him from leaving the house. In the movie, the ceremony itself doesn't actually change anything about Beetlejuice. Or maybe it would have, but Barbara saves the day before it's finished. The musical actually has him brought to life by the wedding, making him mortal and thus vulnerable to being murdered again immediately after. Then, thanks to the rules of the musical being cut and dry, Beetlejuice is forced to the netherworld. Honestly, if they had just ended his story there, I would have been satisfied, but they did us one better. Juno stops him before he goes to the netherworld, and she's revealed to be Beetlejuice's mother. Throughout the musical, anytime Lydia would bring up wanting to be reunited with her mom, Beetlejuice is unable to relate as his relationship with his own mother was so toxic. Juno threatens Lydia, but Beetlejuice stands up to her. Even though it was only for a brief moment, the flood of emotions that Beetlejuice felt as he was brought to life was enough to teach him a lesson. His vulnerability leads to him being tricked by Juno, but then it's Beetlejuice that gets to ride in on a sandworm and save the day. Instead of just being an antagonistic weird Weirdo, Beetlejuice in the musical actually has an arc of his own. His story runs parallel to Lydia's, and by the end of the journey, he's actually become a better person. Isn't it amazing how much more interesting these characters can be when you actually give them characteristics and goals? Turns out people contain multitudes. Part 4. Beetlejuice, the conclusion, the conclusion, the conclusion. Did not like the movie. Why not? Did not, couldn't get into it. Explain yourself. What didn't it, you like about it? It insists upon itself, Lois. What? It insists upon itself. What does that even mean? Beetlejuice as a movie is underdeveloped. The characters are unmotivated and unlikable, carried by star power as they sleepwalk through a boring story and learn nothing. I often see people saying that they want this movie to be remade, but I'm telling you it already has been. The musical adaptation of Beetlejuice improves on the movie in every way, to the extent that it makes the movie irrelevant. This never happened. It will shock you how much it never happened. The only thing that this movie has going for it at this point is accessibility, since a pro-shot version of the musical still isn't available. This isn't even a problem for me at this point, because watching bootlegs can make even small moments feel like Captain America lifting Mjolnir. <laughs> Hollywood inevitably decides to reboot this franchise, I desperately hope that they'll use the Broadway musical as their template. I'm sure I'll regret this when they cast Josh Gad as Beetlejuice or James Corden as Otho, but I truly believe that this is the format best suited to this story. The musical took the building blocks provided by the movie and turned them into a funny, heartwarming story that actually deserves a spot in your Halloween rotation. Every adaptation should strive to improve on its source material to this extent. Eddie Perfect and company transformed this story into something that everybody should experience, and that, my friends, is why I believe that Beetlejuice works best as a music. Fuck. Shit. Jesus. Fuck shit, Jesus is right. Well, I set out to rip and tear. How did I do? <laughs> Thank you.
Did he at least die painlessly? To shreds, you say. Well, how is his wife holding up? To shreds, you say. Was I too harsh? Did I miss anything? Am I completely full of shit? Do you think my voice is sexy? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you have any extra money burning a hole in your pocket, consider tossing a few shekels my way, would ya? I have a Patreon if you want to support my future work, or a PayPal link if you just want to give me a tip. I have no shame in admitting that I am very broke and drowning in student loan debt, so every little bit helps. Thank you for watching, and if you're one of the brave warriors out there filming slime tutorials, please keep doing what you're doing. This project wouldn't have been possible without the work of a bunch of people who don't even know that they contributed. A lot of the sources of the footage in this video have had their accounts deleted, so if you're seeking out slime tutorials, please don't be a snitch. Thank you for letting me get these Beetlejuice thoughts off my chest. See you in hell. I'm gonna use the door. Hey, guys. Yeah. We're hardly working up a sweat. And we'll probably regret that we ever met. We can't get upset, don't forget. You can only work with what you get. You can only work with what you get. And I got you, babe.